All right, it is March 1st, 2021, and we're looking at World War II. So we've got to get a lot of stuff in here, miles and miles and miles of things to talk about. There's a poem, there's a poem, just a second. Uh, something about the snowy, uh, the snowy night, is that right? No, I don't think so, let's see, Robert Frost. He says, uh, the last three lives are something like, and I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. And miles to go before I sleep. Well, let's get down the road, shall we? World War II. The ABC Agreement. Okay, this is, uh, uh, the agreement here is to simply be uh, us saying to the United Kingdom, hey, we're going to get involved in the war, and we promise that we're going to put most of our effort into stopping Hitler before we try to stop Japan. The reason we're going to stop Hitler first is because Hitler's about to smack around the UK. Well, he's already smacking around the UK, but to you know get rid of the UK. So we're going to we're going to come to the aid of our allies first, and then we're going to go deal with Japan. So the ABC agreement. Now this is World War Two is different than World War One. World War Two is is a is a logistical nightmare because we're not just fighting uh, over in France against Germany like we were in World War One. In World War II, we're going to be fighting all over the world. I mean, like, literally, on like almost every continent, it seems like there's some sort, some sort of something going on. So the logistics of getting from point A to point B, it is what it is. Uh, and then we're up against the time. Uh, there is a clock going. Yes, we're trying to save UK from being annihilated, but we also have things that we know that Germany is working on. For example, they're working on the bomb, and if they can get the bomb before we get the bomb, no, yeah, no, nope, that's no, nope, no, nope. we need to get the bomb first. So there's a clock running. The ABC agreement. Korematsu versus the United States. This is so important that I'm not going to talk much about it because we're going to save this for your supplemental readings on Wednesday. All of your supplemental readings this week are based on this uh, incident. And then we'll talk about it extensively on Thursday. So the short version here is that uh, the U.S. government said, hey look, we have a whole bunch of Japanese in California on the west coast out there. And since Japan attacked us in uh, Pearl Harbor, therefore, there's potentially enemy Japanese who are right here on our coast. So we're going to round up all the Japanese and we're going to put them in uh, internment camps. Whether you were an American citizen or not. So we rounded up our own American citizens and put them in camps. I just have so much to say about that, but we're gonna we're gonna wait we're gonna wait till Thursday to talk all about that. Make sure you do your readings on Wednesday, read down through it, and you'll see. Anyway, one of the one of the uh, members, uh, one of the Japanese who were who was in uh, was placed in these camps, uh, Fred Korematsu, he's going to sue the United States of America uh, for doing this to him, and uh, United States of America is going to say, no, we're allowed to round you up and put you in camps. So much to talk about, but I'm going to move on because, right, okay, I already said that. A couple of cartoons here, uh, Dr. Seuss again, so here he says, uh, waiting, for the, waiting for the signal from home, the honorable fifth column. So a fifth column, I don't know if we've talked about, I think we did last year, but a fifth column is an underground network of, of uh, spies, perhaps, or ne'er-do-wells that have come into the country and they're pretending to be regular, ordinary people, but when somebody blows the whistle or somebody gives them the code word or whatever it happens, then they rise up and, and, uh, and do devastating terrorist attacks or whatever. So the fifth column. Here we have Dr. Seuss saying, look, here's all these Japanese uh, who are being given their bricks of dynamite, their TNT, and then they're going to go off and be regular, ordinary Americans until they get the signal. And you see the guy up there looking, looking for the signal across the ocean. Same, same kind of idea here with the cartoon. Okay. <clears throat> so, we're going back to war. We're going to get out of the Great Depression because we need to put everybody to work. 
We've got to build guns. We've got to build tanks. We've got to build planes. We're going to build. We're going to build a whole bunch of stuff in a very short amount of time. To do that, we got to put uh, all the all the able-bodied all the able-bodied men in the factories, and then send them off. And then able-bodied women are going to come in and work in the factories as well. The War Production Board, the WPB, is going to uh, is going to say, "All right." We need to, we need to all get together, guys. So we're going to put a we're going to put a uh, speed limit out there because before this we didn't really have speed limits. And I know you're saying, "Whoa, seriously, there were no speed?" Yeah, well, people, and that's yeah, speed limits. So the speed limit was set at 55 miles per hour, and that way it conserved gasoline so that we could then use the gasoline for the tanks and the planes. Uh, and there you go, gasoline rationing. You can only have so much per week. Price ceilings to combat inflation. So we know this happens, right? During a wartime, uh, prices go up because scarcity and or people are just being warmongers and they're making lots of money. Um, and so FDR and Congress set war, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, set price ceilings. So a price ceiling is the maximum, it's the ceiling, it's the maximum that you can charge for a good or service. Now you know what happens if somebody sets a price ceiling, right? Then that's suddenly the price, because everybody's like, oh, that's the maximum I can charge? Well, I'm going to charge the maximum. Um, there are also, I mean, there are uh, 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 price floors. We have price floors. Uh, FDR did that with, with grain, right, with the, the food. Uh, this is the minimum that we're going to that that we're that we're allowed to pay you for this. So the the minimum amount. We have uh, wage ceilings. Wage ceilings. This is the maximum amount you can be paid. We have uh, wage floors. We call that minimum wage. And you'll study all of that next year in economics. It'll be exciting. Uh, and here's a. Uncle Sam, and he says, I need the tin in your empty toothpaste and shaving cream tubes. You think to yourself, where's the tin in the shaving cream, in, in a toothpaste? Well, yeah, the old toothpaste, uh, old toothpaste tubes, if you squeeze out all the toothpaste and you cut it open and you fold it, fold it out, you can see it, it looks like aluminum foil except it's tin. So they take that tin and then they, you can give it back to the government and then, yay, they can go build airplanes. That'd be aluminum. Yeah, whatever it is. Every time you twist a nut, think of Hitler. You, the implication here is that uh, you're working to build car, uh, cars and tanks and planes, and every time you're building something, then you think of Hitler because he's an evil, evil guy, and we're doing this to get rid of him. So every time you twist a nut, Think of Hitler. Hey, this this one, whew, I, I bring this one up simply because not only is this class in American history all about American history, but it's also about how not to, <laughs> how not to present information with regard to font and or spacing of words. I'm going to read this to you. Here it goes. It says, save rubber. Now, by the way, when you get to your PowerPoint and you look through this, the first time you read it, you're going to be like, whoa, what? What? But I've practiced, so I got it. Save rubber. Make your tires stretch till victory is won. As you know, rubber comes from trees, but now there's a monkey up every tree. Don't depend on some wizard to present you with the set of synthetics real soon. Your tiles will have to last for the duration, so walk to work or use other means of transportation. If you must use your car, let's get going on the war together. You, you wash my back and I'll wash yours. That's reciprocity. We'll ride to work in my car this week and yours next, and the next week is yours. That's cooperation. Let's be good neighbors. Terrible spacing, terrible font usage, etc., etc. Don't be like the person who put that poster together. Be more like this guy. Every time you twist a nut, think of Hitler. We're not just talking about 
white, male, able-bodied men going to war and helping out the United States economy. We're talking about everybody. And so, um, we're talking about North America, and with the Braceros, right? The Mexican laborers who went to work on agriculture farms in the West. So here's a, here's a newspaper article from September 9th of 1943. And it says, Mexican workers wanted in October. Farmers and orchardists, orchard, orchardists, or, orchard, somebody who works in the orchard, like an apple orchard, orchardists, right? Farmers and orchardists in Washington state have placed orders for approximately 6,000 imported Mexican workers for the month of October. Okay, so uh, bringing Mexican workers into the West to work in the, it says placed orders, placed, you do that on Amazon, how would you do that? Place orders for okay. Women in the workforce. 216,000 women signed up for the military. And now we're not talking about women going out on the front lines, giving them a gun, going to the front lines. No, 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 no. Uh, the women here are going to be working behind the scenes. We're talking about logistics. We're talking about transportation. We're talking about, uh, we had women pilots who, who uh, flew, didn't fly combat missions, but flew, uh, uh, did uh, other types of transportation. We're talk talking about women in the factories. We're talk obviously, we're talking about nurses. We're talking about uh, uh, food workers. We're talking about all that kind of stuff, but not uh, frontline military. But 216,000 women went into the armed forces. And then obviously millions of women, millions of women uh, took the jobs of their husbands, went into the factories and began to work there. And then obviously millions of women continued their household roles as well. Uh, number one most famous poster of World War II? Is it number, number? Yeah, probably. We can do it. This is Rosie the Riveter. Rosie the Riveter and, and her line, we can do it. And so a, a riveter is somebody who rivets. Yeah, somebody who rivets. Uh, I, was gonna say, I guess you could use that as a noun and a verb. Rivets. Rivets. They, they use rivets to rivet into, anyway, they're like giant screws or nails, kind of a combination of the two, and you put them into the aluminum sidings for the airplanes and the tanks and all that kind of stuff. So, bolts, maybe, could, I don't know, rivets. Uh, what to tell your husband if he objects to you getting a wartime job? So, the, so the, the, the man of the family says, but I can support our family. And the, the wife's response should be something to the effect of, it isn't just a question of pride. Millions more women must take jobs or our war effort will bog down. It means winning the war, saving the lives of our boys. It's up to each husband to help his wife get a job. Okay, so uh, Life Magazine. Life Magazine was like, number one magazine for like forever and uh they it was a, it was a large it was a big big magazine um and they had huge pictures huge pictures and so here we have uh does it have her name it does not but uh down here in the lower corner it says air force pilot and so uh like i said w uh, women women in the planes for transportation etc etc and then we have uh, picture of the ladies of one of the MASH units, right? Uh, the uh, Mobile Army Surgical Hospitals, is that right? Close enough. And uh, the nurses. All right. The African American uh, uh, men are going to be, uh, and women, are going to uh, join in the cause here. And we have uh, FDR is going to look at the United States and he's going to say, look, the South is still behind the North when it comes to industrialization. How long ago was the Civil War, right? How long ago was Reconstruction? The South is still lagging behind. So FDR gives the Southern states more, uh, more uh, government, uh, what, am I, what am I trying to say? Contracts, there we go. More government contracts to maybe jumpstart some of the uh, economic woes that the South has. So good for FDR, right? Uh, a lot of uh, African Americans are going to move to the North to try to to try to get some of the factory jobs um, that are being uh, left open by the guys who are moving across across uh, into the war. 
And they are going they are going to face discrimination in the North, the African Americans. 1943, 1944, still facing uh, discrimination. Let's see, 43, we're still, what, five years away from uh, desegregating law schools, and we're still seven, eight years away from desegregating K-12 schools. And we're still 20 years away from Martin Luther King Jr. Well, we're getting there, we're getting there. Uh, the FDR created the Fair Employment Practices Commission to ensure there was no discrimination in defense-oriented jobs. So, if your job had something to do with the war, you could not be discriminated against uh, based on your color of your skin. Yes, I know the implication is, so what if you're not working in a job that deals with the war? Yeah, I know. I know. The Civil Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it's coming. It's coming. It's just not here yet. All right, the code talkers. So, uh, I'll be, uh, uh, communications, uh, and we're talking specifically over here in, uh, over there in the uh, Pacific Ocean. Uh, the communication between point A and point B between all the islands and all the different fleets is done by radio. Well, the problem with radio is that uh, everybody can listen in, right? And so the bad guys can listen into all your radio transmissions. So you, have to, so you have to use a code. Well, codes are broken all the time. Uh, I mean, you could make a code that nobody could break, but then you know, then you play the game of how how fast can you decode a code if you make it too intricate, too difficult, um, and then the process to decode it takes too long, well, you're in the middle of a war, maybe that's not something you want to do. So, okay, you make the code simple. If you make the code simple, then, ah, then the, then the bad guys can uh, read it. Uh, they can break it pretty easy. <clears throat> we, the United States, stumbled across a unbreakable code. We used Native Americans. Um, and we, Coman uh, let's see, Comanches and Cherokee and Choctaw, but ultimately, the Navajo was probably the strongest of the codes, and they talked in their own language. Now, here's the deal. Navajo did not have a written language. So, uh, trying to write it down, if, you know, the, the Japanese trying to listen to it over the radio, uh, trying to write it down would, would be impossible, number one. But number two, the Navajo were pretty tricky, but were pretty tricky. And it goes something like this. If somebody wanted to say, we're going to go east, we're going to go east, then one Navajo uh, uh, Indian would be on the sending side, and he would say east, except he would spell it out, and he would say east. And again, I'm just using this as an example. So he would say elephant, apple, sun, turtle, E-A-S-T, right? Elephant, apple, sun, turtle. And then the Navajo Indian on the receiving end would say, okay, right, let me, let me read that back to you to make sure I got that. We're going to we're going to do egg asbestos. Uh, <laughs> I can't think of my S word. School and timeout. Egg asbestos school and timeout. It's the same four letters, right? And then the first Navajo would say yes, yes. Again, I'm sending it, and it is Engelberg. Astonine, <laughs> somewhat terrible. Now they just said E A S T three, three different times. And can you imagine the poor Japanese trying to listen to this, going, "What? I don't. What is going on?" They never did break that code. They never did break that code. Um, so there you go. The Navajo Indian, the Code Talkers. Nicholas Cage was in the movie. I think Nicholas Cage called Code Talkers. Now, did the Germans have a, did they have an unbreakable code? Yeah, they had a, they had a, a pretty crazy code using the Enigma machine. If you get a chance to, to watch the film U571, right? Is that right? Or uh, A Brilliant Mind talk about the guys over there in UK who were trying to break the code of, of, the, of the Axis powers of Germany, Germany and, and the gang. Um, the code breaking 
was crazy and ultimately we had to steal him we <laughs> we had to steal an enigma machine and eh, we'll talk about that on tuesday what do you think sounds good moving on now while we while we are fighting over there in europe we are obviously dealing with uh, the japanese over here in the pacific so uh, you know, we talk about Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, but what a lot of people don't realize is that Pearl Harbor was just one attack during that, during that day. The Japanese also hit U.S. forces at uh, Guam and Wake Island and the Philippines all at the same time. So it wasn't just Pearl Harbor. Now, Pearl Harbor is where, you know, is, is the, easily the most famous because that was like Hawaii. And we had the sinking of the Arizona, et cetera, et cetera. But um, they did hit us in several islands at the same time. General Douglas MacArthur is going to be in the Philippines, and he's going to hold out for about five months before he's going to eventually have to be evacuated. And he's going to have a very famous statement, I, I will return. I will return. Um, kind of one of those big uh, kind of manly men kind of things. I'll be back kind of things. Uh, there were, uh, uh, we had uh, captured, Amer several hundred captured American soldiers were forced to march 80 miles uh, in the Philippines. They call that the Bataan Death March in April 1942. Lots of American soldiers uh, didn't make the march, and some of them who did make it were then executed later. We have the guy with the sword about to chop off his head. So, war is awful, guys. War is awful. All right, it looks like I'm out of battery juice. No, I'm not. All right, so this line here is as far as the Japanese got with regard to holding all the islands. Here's Midway and then Hawaii. So Yamamoto, Yamamoto's plan was to extend all the way into Fiji, New Caledonia, and to Midway. So if they had taken Midway then they could easily stage bombing runs to Hawaii or New Zealand or Australia. Midway. One of my favorite books, Life of Pi, right? They were in they were in Manila. No, they're the Marianas. And then they let's see, they to the Marianas and the Marianas. And the, the line is, we were midway to midway, and the ship sank. And then there was a tiger in the boat, and it all got crazy. Unless you believe it was really the chef, but then, no, he was the hyena. The tiger was, oh, the tiger was Richard Parker, right? Depending on how you believe it. It depends if you believe that bananas float. You need to read the book. It's a great book. The battle was at Midway and uh, the Coral Sea. Let's see, so it was uh, May of 42 and June of 42. Were based off were basically carrier battles, and so the big air, air aircraft carriers, where the planes land on the on the boat, you know what I'm talking about. And so these are aircraft carrier battles, and the United States was, again, if you recall from last week, we were very very fortunate that our aircraft carriers were not at Pearl Harbor when they were supposed to be. The Japanese thought they would sink them at Pearl Harbor, and the aircraft carriers were actually uh, further south on a training exercise that the Japanese didn't know about. So we were able to bring our aircraft carriers into the battle immediately. And here, and, and here just uh, six months later after uh, Pearl Harbor, we're going to be fighting or we're going to be using them to fight. And so uh, crazy stuff, right? You see all this, all these, the flak and the guns and all this crazy stuff. Um, the Japanese are going to realize that uh, one possible way to attack aircraft carriers is to uh, uh, to dive bomb the aircraft carriers with their planes and use their planes as bombs and so we call those kamikaze pilots I think we've got pictures coming up later so how do you beat the Japanese it's very difficult because the Japanese did not surrender I mean there's there's very, very, very few cases of Japanese soldiers surrendering to the Allies. I mean, they, 
We're talking about miles and miles and miles and miles of ocean and islands and oh my goodness and the Japanese uh, were uh, entrenched in a lot of these islands. So the United States came up with an interesting, interesting plan here. They called it leapfrogging. And so they, uh, they looked at the map and they said, well, that island there has a whole bunch of, ja this little bitty island here has a whole bunch of Japanese on it. You know what? We're not going to do anything about that. We're not going to fight them on that island. What we're going to do is we're going to cut them off. We're going to cut off their supplies. And then where are they going to go? They can't go anywhere. So we're just going to cut them off. And then we're just going to go to the next island. So they call that leapfrogging, going, jumping from island to island and determining, do we, really need to, do we really need to take this island back? Because if we, if we don't need to take this island, we'll just skip it and then cut them off because they can't go anywhere. It's actually kind of a brilliantly strategic plan, right? Battle for uh, control of Guadalcanal Island allowed unrestricted access to Australia. Admiral Chester Nimitz. Uh, was in charge of the Pacific Campaign, and ultimately, uh, let's see, in the summer of 1944, we're going to, to capture Saipan and Tinian and the Marianas Islands, and now that we are that close, uh, we're going to be able to stage bombing runs on Japan. Back to Europe. All right, the three points of halting the Axis. The first one was the Battle of the Atlantic. Once we figured out radar, once we actually got it going and really established what we were doing, then you have radar and then you have sonar. And once we had sonar, then we could find the, uh, we could find the Germans' U-boats, the Nazi U-boats, the submarines. And once you, you know, submarines work really well until they're discovered. And once they're discovered, uh, then uh, once they're identified, then they have to turn to run. And so now that we have sonar, uh, the submarines aren't as nasty. Number two, October 1942, the Battle of El Alamein in North uh, Egypt. The British, British uh, General Montgomery is going to defeat the Nazi General uh, Rommel uh, in North Africa. So Rommel, Rommel, uh, golly, he was brilliant. Uh, the Nazi general Rommel, he was, he was strategically brilliant, tactically a genius. He used his tanks in some crazy ways and just blew through all of North Africa, basically took over all of North Africa for the Nazis. Then Montgomery is going to, uh, is going to uh, use some interesting tactics. Man, I wish this were, <laughs> I wish this were military history class because we could do a lot with this kind of stuff. But uh, is going to defeat Rommel in uh, in Egypt. Yeah, is that what it says? North Egypt. Yeah, in Egypt. September of 1942, the USSR is going to defend uh, is going to defend Stalingrad. Hitler is going to attack Stalingrad with a lot of people, and when I say a lot of people, we're talking about a lot of soldiers. And then uh, Stalin's uh, Russians. Soviets are going to repel the Nazis. So Hitler's going to feed more troops into Stalingrad and more troops and more troops. And then Stalin realizes this is the battle. This is it. So he sends more troops and more troops. Ultimately, in one single battle, now obviously this is going to take place not over one day, but we're talking about days and weeks and months, uh, one battle. 1.3 million deaths in one battle. 1.3 million deaths. Uh, crazy, just crazy uh, in uh, the Soviet Union. Okay. So Hitler is actively attacking the Soviet Union and Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of the UK, and then FDR, the three of them are going to get together and they're going to come, well, they're going to, <laughs> they're going to be talking a lot. But the two, the UK and the USA are going to realize, man, um, if we don't do something, Russia's going down. So they decided to open up a second front. The idea is if you open up a second front, then Germany has to split its forces and can't concentrate on, on Russia. 
which is <laughs> Stalin's very happy about that. So we decide to attack from the south and go up against Mussolini uh, down in Italy. Uh, and so we call that, uh, what do we call that, invasion of Italy? There's a name for it. What was the name for it? There was a name for it. So in, in 1943, uh, FDR and Winston Churchill meet at Casablanca, and they determined that they were, are only going to accept unconditional surrender from the Axis powers. A conditional surrender would be, okay, we give up, but we get to keep X, Y, Z. An unconditional surrender is, we give up, we're sorry, you can do whatever you want, you can take whatever you want, that kind of stuff. In September 1943, uh, Italy is going to surrender, Benito Mussolini is going to be uh, ousted, and then he's going to be uh, hanged by basically his own people. Uh, Germany continues to fight in Italy for the Italians who are no longer in the war. Now, here's why this is important. We're going to start, we're going to push up towards, to the north, talking about the, the Allies. We're going to start pushing towards the north. There's the Alps Mountains there, right? And so we're only going to get so far. The, our plan is actually to come in through France. But because we had to stop and come down through the south and come up through Italy as a diversion to keep Hitler off Stalin's back. This gives Stalin a little more time to get his troops uh, to be moving forward, to be moving towards Germany. This is a big deal later. This is a big deal later. And so, um, let's jump to it. The invasion of France. So we call this D-Day, uh, June 6, 1944. If you get a chance to see Saving Private Ryan, right, at least the first, the opening 17, 18 minutes, very graphic, very bloody. The, Tom Hanks and his troops have to get off the boat, go across the beach, go up the hill. Um, it's an amazing movie. It won all sorts of Academy Awards, but if you're not ready for it, oof, it's tough. It's tough to watch. Steven Spielberg directed it, and it's it's an amazing movie. But the first, like I said, 17, 18, 19 minutes is is the is the trying to capture the beach there. So there were what four or five beaches. There's Juno Beach and Sword Beach and Utah Beach and Omaha Beach. Omaha Beach is the one that Sam and Private Ryan is talking about there. Uh, so there's going to be, an, uh, in November 1943, Churchill, Stalin, and FDR meet at Tehran to coordinate the, the second attack. And we are going to do it, in fact, uh, there's bad weather, and we had to push it one way, and we had to push it another way, and then, no, if we don't attack here, then we're going to have to push it another two weeks. And so there's lots of crazy stuff going on in D-Day that's kind of interesting to read. Go ahead, Wikipedia, that bad boy. But um, the largest coordinator and amphibious landing ever. But ultimately, we're going to be successful. We're going to get up the hill. We're going to uh, capture the, the Nazis uh, you know, up there, the machine gun embankments. And we're going, to have, we're going to establish a foothold in France. And once we have a foothold in France, then we can start landing our tanks, and we can start landing our howitzer guns, and we can start moving to the east towards Germany. And ultimately, this is going to be the beginning of the end for Hitler. Uh, let's see, 11,590 aircraft in the D-Day, uh, 14,500 uh, 14 flight missions, 6,000 boats, 4,413 deaths total for the Allies, 20, uh, almost 2,500 Americans died in the D-Day invasion. Oof. But between 4,000 and 9,000 Nazis died. Meanwhile, there's an election going on back at the, back at the homestead. And so in the blue, uh, the Democrat, FDR, is going to win his fourth term. Uh, this is going to be his last term. Look at that. Red Florida is blue. Red Tech. Ooh, red Oklahoma. Oh, are you kidding me? Look at that. that we, are, we are blue. Yeah, except for the couple little people in there. Uh, all right. So... Oh, look at that. Oklahoma has 10 votes. 
we don't have 10 votes now, we only have seven votes, which means we lost three votes. I wonder why we lost three votes. AP government, I'll tell you why. All right, the last days of the war itself, Hitler's gonna throw all, all that he can, all of his remaining troops basically against us in, the, in West Germany. We're gonna call this the Battle of the Bulge and he's gonna push, call it the Bulge, cause you know, bulge, bulges out, right? And so the Americans are gonna have the strategy of backing up, backing up, backing up, but not breaking the line, backing up, backing up, and ultimately we're gonna surround them and we're gonna beat the Nazis that way. The, the 101st Airborne Division are going to be the heroes, and people are still talking about them today. All right, so then April 1945. This is, this is a big month. Here we go. American troops officially discover concentration camps. April 1945. So we're talking about the Jewish, the Holocaust, concentration camps uh, in Germany and Poland and Austria. We are going to officially discover them. Uh, which is going to just cause all sorts of crazy news stories. The Soviets capture Berlin in, 19, in April of 1945. April 12th of 1945, our president dies. President FDR dies of brain hemorrhage, and so President Truman's going to take over, or Vice President Truman's going to become president. On April 30th, Hitler commits suicide. So, gosh, FDR died 18 days before Hitler uh, took the coward's way out and committed suicide down in the bunker um, with his uh, girlfriend, Eva Braun. And then May 7th, Germany unconditionally surrenders, and on May 8th, they proclaim it VE Day, uh, victory in Europe. Yay, and the war's over. Oh, wait, Japan. So... Remember when I said coming up through Italy is going to delay us some? Well, here's the problem with this, guys. Again, this is American history, so we're looking at it from our American centrist point of view. Uh, ah, there was a race to Berlin. There was a race. Could we get there before the Soviets could get there? And we, we weren't able to. The Soviets beat us there by a couple of weeks, actually. So the Soviets got to put a very, very, very famous photo of the Soviet flag being placed at the top of the Reichstag, which is the government building in Berlin. So the Soviets beat us there. Why is that important? Well, Joseph Stalin's going to say, well, we got there, so therefore Berlin is ours, therefore Germany is ours. And here in not too terribly long from now, we're going to break Germany up into four pieces. And then ultimately two pieces. We're going to have East Germany and West Germany, and we're going to have the Cold War and all that kind of stuff, and the Berlin Wall and all that. And that would never have happened. It would never have happened, probably. Had we not, had we, had we gotten to Berlin first, but we didn't get to Berlin because we tried to distract Hitler going through Italy to help him. Ah! Famous picture of the, I think these are Brit, Brits, they might be Americans, I'd have to look it up, uh, shaking hands with the Russians there in Berlin. So, back in the Pacific, we're going to start, uh, like I said, we took, we, uh, we took the Philippines, we took the Marianas Islands, and now we're going to start fire, fire bombing Tokyo, dropping you know, huge bombs on Tokyo. Uh, 83,000 killed in Tokyo. General MacArthur, here's his famous picture. There's General MacArthur in his, uh, in his very wet pants, and he's coming up onto the beach there in the Philippines saying, I told you I'd be back, and I, I will return, and he just did. The islands of Iwo Jima and Okinawa were captured in March and April of 1945 despite Japanese kamikaze planes, and here's a pretty famous photo of, I mean, that's much more famous than this photo, but this one is pretty famous. You see the airplane here, the kamikaze, which is a Japanese word for divine wind, divine meaning God-inspired, right? God-inspired wind, and so the kamikaze pilots were suicide bombers, and they would fly their planes into the ship because they had those, you know, those fairly sizable Mitsubishi engines, and boom. The Potsdam Conference, July 1945. Churchill, Stalin, and Truman 
are going to do the same thing. They're going to say we're going to uh, unconditional. We're all going, only going to take unconditional surrender from Japan. Surrender or be destroyed. Remember, I told you 45 minutes ago that the Germans were going to build the, build a bomb, and we're going to build a bomb. Well, we worked on it a little faster than they did. Although we, it's interesting to see just how close they were to getting a bomb. Um, we're going to have a group based off Einstein's. E equals MC squared, right? And and they're going to meet. Uh, they're going to start in New York, then they're going to go to Chicago, and ultimately they're going to go out to New Mexico, and they're going to uh, build uh, the bomb. And so we have uh, some pretty wild and crazy stories um, with regard to that. If you get a chance to read one book with regard to that, um, oh, there's so many. But uh, if you read the biography. Uh, Surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman. Uh, Richard Richard P. Feynman was one of the uh, was one of the math guys behind the workings of the atomic bomb. And it's a hilarious book, but uh, all the crazy stuff that was going on back then. So, let's see. American, if we call that the Manhattan Project, led by led by Robert Oppenheimer, detonated its test bomb on July of 16th, out there by uh, uh, Alamogordo, New Mexico. Crazy. I mean, it's just crazy stuff. <laughs> one of the one of the uh, one of one of the math guys was like, you know, there's a there's like a point zero 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 one percent chance that, you know, once the chain reaction starts, that's not going to stop. That we're going to blow up like the whole world with this one bomb. <laughs> And somebody hit the button, and now it didn't blow up the whole world, but wow, right? Okay, uh, my next slide has a lot of a lot of the details about this. On August sixth, we're going to drop the uh, we're going to drop little boy, and it's a uranium bomb. We're going to drop it on Hiroshima. Several days before we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, we uh, we sent bombers over over uh, Japan and we dropped leaflets, we dropped pieces of paper that basically said get out of Hiroshima, get out, get out, we're going to drop this bomb on at this time, on this day, and you do not want to be here. So we warn them, we warn them uh, that we're going to drop the bomb on August 6th, drop by the by the bomber Enola Gay, and estimates of 180,000 deaths from the one bomb. Now the timeline says that uh, we dropped the bomb, 180,000 deaths. Truman calls uh, Hirohito, the, uh, the emperor, the Hirohito says, nope, that wasn't you, that was an act of God you guys didn't, you didn't, you, that couldn't have come from, from humans, that kind of destruction. And Truman's like, uh, we, we told you when and where, so, and then and we called our shot, and it happened, so you need to surrender. And Hirohito said, no, we don't believe you. And so Truman said, okay, well, we're going to do it again. So two, three days later, on August 9th, we have Fat Man, which is a plutonium bomb, is going to be dropped on Nagasaki. Again, we dropped leaflets ahead of time and said, you need to leave this place because we're going to drop this bomb. Unfortunately, a lot of Japanese picked those pieces of paper up and said, oh yeah, well we don't believe the United States can do it twice. And so they moved to Nagasaki. They were more people moved to Nagasaki uh, to see it happen live. So we dropped the second bomb, and again, eighty thousand people, eighty thousand people uh, died uh, in the second bomb. Hirohito immediately surrendered, and let's see, it was an unconditional surrender with the stipulation, <laughs> with the one stipulation that Hirohito gets to keep his job title. And then on September 2nd, the end of the war was proclaimed 
the J Day of Victory in Japan. So, uh, so um, the pictures of the two bombs going off, and then these are the sizes of the bombs. Uh, you can go to the Atomic Bomb Museum there in uh, New Mexico and see. So there's the little boy, and then the guy back behind him would be Fat Man, right? Is that how that works? So, just a couple of uh, FAQs here. So the first one was, uh, the first one, um, <laughs> my knee went funny there. We had uh, the three three planes, the Enola Gay that had the bomb, and then you had the great artiste and the necessary evil that photographed the bomb. Uh, the little boy, the bomb itself, held 141 pounds of uranium-235, which was equivalent to 32 million, excuse me, 32 million pounds of dynamite. The bomb fell for 44 and a half seconds and exploded 1,900 feet above the surface. The reason that it, explode, it didn't explode when it hit the ground, the reason they wanted to explode when, uh, when it was up in the air was so that more of the killing radius, right, more killing radius. Basically, uh, in Hiroshima, one square mile was erased from the planet. Four square miles was an inferno. 70,000 of the, 70% of the city's buildings were destroyed. If we go over here, uh, the other bomb, A52, uh, the B-52 boxcar carried Fat Man. Originally, it was uh, planned to be dropped on uh, Kokura, but that day there were clouds uh, over Kokura, and so they decided to move on and hit their secondary target, Nagasaki. And they only had five pounds, but it was plutonium, Five pounds of plutonium is equal to 42, 42 million pounds of dynamite. Today you can go see the Enola Gay at the Smithsonian. Obviously awful, awful, awful. Burns, clothes being melted onto your skin. Uh, awful. This is the famous observatory the Japanese observatory there at uh, Hiroshima. And you can see how part of it's still standing. Today, you can, uh, you can go see that building. They did not, they did not uh, uh, rebuild it. They left it as a monument to the destruction. And so when I was teaching in Japan, I got to go see, I got to see that building. And it's, it's spooky, scary realizing you know, how that happened. All sorts of interesting stories, the shadows, you know, the shadows on the, on the pavement, that the light was so bright uh, that there were shadows that were permanently affixed to the ground. Most of these shadows you can't see anymore because of the you know, sunlight for the past 80 years, but um, wow, the, it was so bright that it cast permanent shadows on the ground. World War II casualties for the United States was about a half a million people. So we had half a million Americans died in World War II. The Soviet Union lost 25 times that number. They lost 12 and a half million people. We lost half a million. They lost 12 and a half million. There's your chart right there. Uh, if we're talking about Allied war deaths, the Soviet Union, 65% of all the deaths came from the Soviet Union. 23% came from China when they were fighting Japan. And the United States, we are in the dark blues. We just have that little bitty sliver there. Uh, Yugoslavia, UK, France, Poland, etc., etc. Uh, the UK, the US homeland was barely touched. I have one more short story and it goes like this. Hey, you know what? If you've stuck around with me for this past hour, then you're going to like this story. We talk about how uh, Pearl Harbor was, was uh, you know, terrible, awful. Uh, but obviously Hawaii is a long way from here, not part of the contiguous United States. We did have one bombing in the contiguous United States uh, during World War II, and uh, it was in Oklahoma. So here's the story, and it goes like this. A group of B-52s were practicing their bombing runs, and so coming out of Dalton Air Force Base in the Texas Panhandle, and they're they're going to fly to this this little spot out in the middle of these cattle fields that have that there were uh, they had set up four lights in a square and so the idea was at midnight you know looking down through the little gunner things and looking down and trying to hit the bombs 
uh, hit this little square, this little square. Um, so uh, the bombs were dummy bombs. They had four. They only had four pounds of dynamite and like 90 pounds of sand. So it wasn't like they're huge bombs. They're you know practice bombs, but they still had dynamite. So they're flying to their targets, and the lead bomber was not paying attention. And so 45 miles from his target, he looked down and he saw four square, uh, one square, four lights. Well, it turns out it was Boys City, Oklahoma. All the lights had been turned off for the evening. This is around midnight, except for the four corners of the courthouse in Boys City. So at midnight, I don't know if you guys have been out to the panhandle, but there's like, there's nothing out there, right? And so if there's only four lights out there and you're looking, you know, you're up at 20,000 feet or however far, however high you are, and you're looking down, you see four lights, well, that must be it. So they drop bombs. <laughs> they drop bombs thinking that they were out in the middle of these cattle fields and they weren't. So they dropped four bombs on Boys City, Oklahoma. One hit the courthouse, one hit, one hit, uh, a couple of them hit the, the street. Uh, a couple of them m narrowly missed some gasoline tankers. Uh, when the bomb started falling, this one guy jumped in his truck, which was a gasoline tanker, and he was trying to get out of there. One bomb missed his, missed his truck by, uh, by several yards. I mean, it wasn't a lot. Uh, there wasn't a lot of damage because, again, we're talking about only four pounds of dynamite and a whole bunch of sand. So mostly there were just giant gouges in the cement, like a four foot deep hole or whatever. But yay, our claim to fame. And nobody was killed, nobody was hurt. Uh, estimates of $25, according to one site that I was looking at this morning, $25 worth of damage total. There's some glass that was broken out. But uh, it could have been bad. The Boy City uh, sirens started going off, their air raid, and people were like, why would they? Why would the Nazis attack? No, it wasn't the Nazis. It was our own people, people from Texas. Texas. They were off by forty-five miles. And that's not like miles and miles and miles. It was just forty-five miles. Miles to go before I sleep. Miles to go before I sleep. Here's the last slide. It's interesting how history is being rewritten. It says, Sondage en France. Quelle est, selon vous, la nation qui a la plus contribué, contribué à la défaite de l'Allemagne en 1945? Which means, which country, in French, it says, which country helped contribute the most to the Nazis' defeat? And in May of 1945, the poll went out. Now, this is a poll for uh, French uh, uh, in France. 57%, 57% of the people in France believe that the Soviet Union was the main contributor uh, to the defeat of the Nazis. And let's see, 20% to the United States and 12% to the United Kingdom. And then you jump down to, let's jump down to June of 2004, exact same poll. So uh, 2004, so we're talking about uh, 60 years later, 60 years later, the same question. Which country contributed the most to the Nazis' defeat? 58% the United States, 58% the United States, and only 20% the Soviet Union. So it reversed, it reversed 57 and 20 and 58 and 20, but reversed. It's really interesting to me that uh, 60 years later, same poll, different opinion, radically different opinions. Hmm, I wonder why that is. I wonder why that is. All right. No, I, I can guess why. You can too, probably. All right, everybody. I think we're done. Get ready to talk about Quarry Mob 2 versus the United States. Coming up on Wednesday and Thursday. Be good. See you in a little bit. Bye.